We're now joined by a local guy, an SEC official from Sweetwater, Randall Kaiser. Randall, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. How are you, Brian? I'm good. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to sit down with us for a few moments. And uh, folks may not know an SEC official right here in Sweetwater. Just tell us how you got started in officiating. Well, when I, uh, when I came out of high school, there wasn't a big need for 165-pound right pulling guards at the collegiate level to play. So, uh, so I, that was a way for me to be able to stay around the game. Um, back in the, in the 70s, my dad had officiated for a couple of years, and so I, I knew about it during that time. And, you know, there were some legends around the Sweetwater area, Bud Hicks and H.M. H. Selvage and some others who were officials prior to me. And uh, so, you know, it's, it was always kind of a, a way for me to maybe do something later. And uh, so that was, I started immediately out of high school. I uh, graduated from Sweetwater High School in 1984 and was back on the field with uh, Bobby Bright, another Sweetwater legend who worked in the World League as an official. Uh, I was on the field uh, that, that opening night, the fall of 84. And um, so started there, uh, worked my way up to uh, Division II football with Carson Newman, then one then to the 1AA level in the Ohio Valley Conference, uh, and then I joined the uh, newly formed Sunbelt Conference in 2001, which was the newest and latest Division I conference that was developed, uh, and at the same time then uh, went as a part-time official with the Southeastern Conference and then there full-time in 2006. So uh, slow progression, but uh, it was a good climb. Before we talk about more about your climb to the SEC, talk about your years playing at Sweetwater and maybe some of your friends you played with and your coaches at that time. Well, I was uh, my senior year was uh, Coach Bill Duke's uh, inaugural season at Sweetwater. So we had just made the leap from single A to double A. Uh, and uh, I had a contract dispute my junior year and did not play. So that was the first <laughs> year from the age of five years old that I hadn't played football. And uh, – so I came back my senior year and his, uh, he came and asked me if I'd come back and not that I was a great player, but uh, I was happy to do so and uh, played with some, some great folks there, you know, the, the bar boys and, and uh, the breeding boys. And we just lost, we just lost Greg. And so, uh, you know, played with Greg and Jeff both and Jeff who's now at the MTSU as a softball coach, Terrence Cleveland, Terrence probably the hardest hitter I've ever hit in my career. You know, you know, he was a little bitty spunky guy, but holy moly, he could he could flat lead on you. <laughs> Went on to a great career at the University of Tennessee. Sure did. So you you give us uh, your trek up to the SEC. Was that hard? What was the hardest part about making that climb and getting to the SEC? You know, the hardest thing for me was uh, because I didn't play collegiate football and I didn't play in the Southeastern Conference. And uh, at that time, they were really big on looking for former collegiate players. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I was very blessed to, to get to, the, to where I am today. And I did that just from, uh, you know, a slow, steady progression and um, making sure that I'd what we refer to as seeing enough snaps. And uh, so... I, when I first started, I would, at the end of the year, I'd go do my taxes and my guy would say, why do you ever do this? You know, you'd work Friday night for $50 and get up at three o'clock in the morning and drive 300 miles and, you know, make another $125. So uh, it certainly wasn't for the money. Randall Kaiser, he's an SEC official here from uh, Sweetwater. And Randall, tell us what uh, what makes a good official. What has been some attributes that's helped you get to the SEC? Well, I mean, you have to be uh, you have to prepare at our levels just like the teams do and the players do. I mean, you have to put the time in, do the film work, do the rules work. Um, you know, at the end of three and a half hours, four hours after a game. I will tell my wife, you know, look, I'm not making any decisions. You pick where we're going to eat. Just bring me something to eat. I mean, ment you are mentally exhausted. Um, so mental preparation and just the preparation of the game itself is so, so important. Uh, but, you know, you have to be able to communicate. Uh, you have to be able to communicate to, to coaches that uh, are very uh, – 
making very high salaries and they want to know information and they want to know correct information and they want to know it now. Mm-hmm. And uh, when, when things happen, you have to be able to convey that to them in a manner that uh, um, I guess is best suited for the situation. And every situation is a little different. And I guess it goes without saying you have to have pretty thick skin too, I would say. Yeah, we, uh, we, <laughs> we try not to hear the things that are said, I, I won't say to us, but about us on the side. <laughs> <laughs> I always say officials have to be glutton for punishment because uh, you never get told if you've done a good job, you certainly get told if people think you've done a bad job, right? That's, a, that's exactly right. I tell people, you know, and, and some are experiencing now during the COVID-19, I said, you know, turn the video camera on uh, on you at work and let it video everything you do all day long and then let somebody pick it apart. So that's that's kind of what we go through for three and a half hours. And magnify the one mistake that you made. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you're a head linesman. Just tell us uh, where people might see you on the field as a head linesman and what your responsibilities are during the game. So uh, I am uh, on the sideline looking straight down the line of scrimmage on each play. Uh, about three years ago, uh, we now swap sides of the field. So in the first half, the head linesman will typically be on the home team side. And, uh, and then at halftime, we flip over to the visitor side uh, where the chains are operated uh, within the team area. Uh, so I'm, I'm there looking straight down the line of scrimmage. And, uh, you know, we, we give our deep guys a hard time. Basically, we tell them, uh, they just need to keep us in popcorn and Coca-Cola based on what we do versus what they do. But, uh, so we're, we're looking for a multitude of different things. We're looking to, to ensure that the alignments uh, are, are, are good, motions are good. Uh, we're picking up on who our keys are going to be in certain pass situations, kind of what the defense is doing, you know, with those uh, receivers. Are they in press coverage? We're looking for snap infractions. I mean, we're looking – We I, I counted it up one time, and I don't know the number, but we have like 20, 25 different decisions to make on each and every play. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's – there's never a dull moment over there. So I, every time I talk to an official, I ask this question because this would be my weakness if I tried to officiate. How hard was it to learn – to not watch the game and focus on those things that you're supposed to be focused on. Yep. Yeah. You, uh, you know, if you, it, it, it was very hard. And uh, luckily for me, um, having stayed in the game and being around some great officials early in my career, they were able to guide me to that very early on. And uh, you know what, what I tell new officials, I said, it's like a piece of pie. You know, you, you have a piece of pie that's assigned to you. You take care of your piece of pie before you go look at somebody else's. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it takes all eight men that's on the field uh, to have a, a well-officiated game. That's Randall Kaiser. He's official in the Southeastern Conference. Uh, Randall, of course, uh, the off season has been different, and this season will probably be different. Just talk about your perspective and how it's affected you that, it's going to be an SEC-only schedule this season, and it's going to start September the 26th, about a month later than anticipated or supposed to. Yep. Uh, talk about your thoughts on that. Well, you know, with uh, certainly with a 10-game all-SEC schedule, regardless of where you're going within the conference, it's going to be an absolute war on every Saturday. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's uh, not the games that you typically uh, expect for there not to be um, – very competitive. Every game, I think, is going to be be competitive. So, you know, teams have to bring their A game week one, as, as do we as the officials. So, uh, we have to be in midseason stride on week one. Yeah. What can people expect to see? Is there any uh, major rule changes for the 2020 season? You know, there's uh, not like in years past. Uh, we, you know, there are some subtle changes, uh, one of most of which are safety-related rules. Um, the one that immediately comes to mind is uh, the way the defense can line up over the center when they're either in a punt formation or a field goal formation. Uh, you know, we have that one second rule, can't touch the center for one second, but now they have pushed the um, defenders out. They can't even line up over that center. So even if they just line up there and they're in, the, in that box, uh, then that will be an illegal formation foul on the defense. 
Um, as far as, you know, been a lot of talk over t with targeting over the last few years, seems like that's a moving target, uh, so to speak. <laughs> but the only change with it will not change the way we officiate targeting at all. But if a player is removed for targeting, they now will be allowed to stay in their team area uh, and not have to go to the dress room. So okay. that's um, it's a minor change. You brought up targeting, so we'll talk about that. And you, you mentioned it, you alluded to it there. It's a, it's a hot-button issue when you're talking about college football. <clears throat> seemed like a few years ago when targeting was first implemented, it was more based upon somebody that – a player that really looked like they were trying to clean somebody's clock, trying to hurt them. The last couple of seasons, it seemed like if there's any helmet-to-helmet, -helmet, it's targeting. Uh, just talk about the way you guys – view that, the way you implement that rule, um, and is there any talk about intent? Is that player intending to hurt somebody? Is that, does that play a factor at all in the way that's implemented? Well, from targeting, there are, there are two different perspectives of targeting and basically two different rules of targeting. Uh, and the one that you allude to about with the intent is um, anytime we have a targeting foul, it immediately always will go to uh, video review and the replay officials that are at the game site, uh, they will collaborate with the collaboration group in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, and they will come up with a collective decision about, about targeting. And so under the one rule, they're looking for uh, a launch, a crouch, uh, some type of indicator, as the rule book refers to that, as to targeting of a defenseless player, and the, it defines who a defenseless player is. You know, quarterbacks are always defenseless. Kickers are always defenseless. Uh, receivers, you know, attempting to make a catch are always defenseless. And um, there, if the, if they determine that there is incidental contact, maybe you know it's just a face mask to face mask, and there wasn't one of those indicators, then uh, they will take that into consideration. Now, the second part of the targeting rule is the crown of the helmet. Uh, anytime we have contact with the crown of the helmet, which is defined basically anything above the face mask, uh, then that's going to be a foul, regardless of where you actually hit that, uh, that player. If you hit him in the stomach with the crown of your helmet, that's a foul. If you hit him in the side of the head with the crown, that's a foul. Um, so there are two different perspectives to that. And uh, we as officials, you know, we, we, we are going to err on the side of safety. Uh, and we're going to try to put a marker on the ground. And then we're going to, uh, the folks at replay and collaboration will take a look at it uh, in a more controlled environment to, to make the final determination. You mentioned some minor changes to the rules this season. From an official perspective, do you guys like or hate when rules are changed? To me, it would be difficult because you guys got to remember a lot. You've got in your mind how that rule is supposed to be, be uh, implemented, and then it changes. Does that throw a wrench in, in y'all's plans? Well, it's, it certainly makes uh, preparation each year more and more interesting. You know, after you, like me, you have 36 years of football rules bouncing around in there, and it's like, okay, pull out the 2020 edition, not the, not the 2018 edition. Uh, and so that's a lot of times why you'll see us having a conversation on the field. You know, I, I may have something, I go to the referee or others, and I say, this is what I have, and then we wait, okay, all right. Let's walk through this. Let's make sure that we all collectively are correct. Um, so, you know, what, what really um, sometimes gets, nothing doesn't get us, but there's another thing called an editorial change. They may change a word in a rule, which changes the impact of the rule. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, one of those this year, just came to mind as we're talking about it is on a kick play. If a let's say uh, let's say Alabama punts to Tennessee, and the Alabama uh, uh, player on the kicking team goes out of bounds while the kick is in the air and comes back in, that's a foul. If Tennessee catches the punt, he now goes out of bounds and comes back in. That is not a foul. So now you have to you have to put two things together, you know. Did it go out of bounds? Was it still a kick, or was it now a running play? Yeah. 
So some of those things kind of, it's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together sometimes. That's Randall Kaiser, head linesman in the SEC, uh, joining us today for this interview. Appreciate his time. And Randall, you said uh, we moved to the SEC in 2006. So there's had to have been a, a lot of big games, a lot of exciting moments you've been able to be a part of as an official. Uh, give us one or two big moments that you look back and thought, well, that, that was fun. Well, you know, I, I jokingly say everybody likes to ask the question, says, hey, what's the biggest game you've ever worked? And uh, my, and my response is, you know, screw one up and you'll see how big it was. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so they're all big at this level. Uh, but one of, one of my most memorable was uh, I actually had not worked University of Tennessee uh, during my time in the conference. And then there, uh, when Coach Dooley came, uh, the supervisor of officials at that time says, you, you know, you, you can work Tennessee because, you know, the folks you knew early on are no longer there. You didn't graduate from there. So, you, you know, you can unscratch Tennessee. Okay. So I had Tennessee three times that season, um, one of which was at, at LSU. It's Coach Dooley's first or second year, I don't recall. And uh, it's late in the game. Tennessee is up, I think, 13 to nine maybe. And um, there's absolute pandemonium with the clock ticking down to zero. LSU trying to get players in, players off. Uh, they get in. They get set. Snap goes over the, the – quarterback's head in shotgun formation and pandemonium erupts. Tennessee thinks that the game is over and they've won the game. Well, I notice our three deep officials are coming up toward the referee. Uh, I go in, I said, what do we have? Well, we got too many men on the field. I said, okay, I'll start clearing the field. Well, that was a job in and of itself, you know. Uh, so there's a lot of photographs of me and Coach Dooley Looks like we're dancing. We're not really not. But, uh, you know, he was telling me what a great job I'd done all day. And, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we cleared the field. LSU scored the next play. And uh, I noticed, you know, we're, we're not leaving the, the stadium because at that time, by rule, they had to have the try. So I had, I had the pleasure of going to get – trying to get Coach Dooley to come out of the dressing room for the try. Uh, <laughs> So I'm at one end of, of the stadium. I noticed all the crews leaving. I thought, well, I guess we're not having to try. Mm -hmm. so I, I take off and finally get in the van. And uh, so we, we ended that day without having to try. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a great discussion once we got back to the hotel room. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, I, I still tell everybody jokingly, I'll – I'll be home and go to the grocery store and there'll be somebody who will see me and say, I've been waiting to see you. So oh. we're still upset about that, but I just, I would just encourage you to go back and watch. There's 13 men on the field. So not 12, but 13. So. <laughs> well, I guess from an official standpoint, I guess you guys have felt like you've done a good job. If nobody knew you were there, right. You've not oh, become the story. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we, uh, we, we just want to get in and get out and, uh, you know, we want to try to do – we want to be the best of the three teams on the field. Yeah. And, um, you know, all of the men that we work with, that I work with, you know, we love it or we wouldn't do it. Uh, and, you know, if our real jobs really knew how much compassion we had for officiating versus our real jobs, you know, they may be a little upset with us. But uh, – it's just, it's just kind of a calling. It's kind of a passion. And um, otherwise, nobody would do it. When you guys are out there, you don't care who wins. You're not out there trying to stack the deck in favor of another team, are you? No. You know, in fact, I have to do a report at the end of the game. And, and more times than not, I'll end up having to Google the game to see what the final score was for yeah. my report. Um, we see, you know, we see the uniform colors. Uh, and that's about it. It's Randall Kaiser, he's an official in the Southeastern Conference. And Randall, you, we talked about a, a crucial game, a crucial play when things get heated. Uh, I think people would like to know when a game ends, how are you guys handled to get out of there so you don't get into a confrontation or 
or somebody might try to hurt you. You know, people really love their football. Just talk about after the game what happens with the officials. Well, the uh, the conference in the schools do a tremendous job in, in taking care of us from the security standpoint. Uh, they pick us up at our designated hotel where we are in, at the game site, game city, and they get us into the stadium. They stay with us uh, prior to us going on the field uh, and immediately after the game, when the game, or even at halftime, when we come out the field, there's a security detail uh, that's there waiting for us. And um, so at the end of the game, they immediately get us in, in vans and vehicles, and we, we are out of the stadium before people can get out of their seats. Uh, and then we're back at whatever hotel that we're staying at, and then uh, we, we're showered up. And then what a lot of people probably don't realize is, you know, after the game, we'll go into a couple uh, hour meeting, maybe even a little longer, uh, about what happened, plays to look at, things that occurred, you know, uh, so it's it's not over for us when the when the final whistle or the final seconds tick off the clock. You guys are graded. I mean, I'm sure if, if uh, there is a crucial play, or you're graded on the the game that you've done. Correct. Just tell folks about that a little bit. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty extensive process that we go through. Uh, we are um, we get at the end of the game. Somebody has evaluated, not a, looked at our. Um, game and they have things that they will comment on. They'll ask questions about, you know, what did you have? What was the play situation here? What was this, the discussion between you and the coach? Uh, you know, information is knowledge. So they're, they're just looking for information. And uh, so, you know, that may last up to two hours, maybe even longer, uh, depending upon the game situation. And then uh, as the week then progresses, um, the, Universities have the opportunity to send plays in to the supervisor of officials on Sunday saying, hey, look, I'd like an explanation for this play. What happened? Uh, why was this called? Why was this not called? Is this a foul? Is this not a foul? Uh, and then we have a film grader. Uh, a lot of our film graders are either current or former NFL officials and or NFL supervisors. And so they look at every play at every position and they're not only looking at, did we make a correct call, but they're looking at, were we in the correct position? Were our mechanics correct? Did we move where we needed to go to? Um, you know, so there's a lot more to it than just, um, was that a foul, was that not? Yeah. And um, we get graded on that. We'll get, you know, we get that typically on Wednesday morning, you know, via email or, and uh, so we're all looking at it. Okay, then we're going to look at, the, the film, let me see what they're talking about. And uh, so we start breaking it down yet again. So you get that on Wednesday. I, I know you can't tell me where you're going to be opening week, but when do you know what your assignment is for the next weekend's ball game? We will, uh, of course, this year's different. So, uh, you know, we didn't even know we were going to have a season probably till uh, mid August. And, um, we, we finally received our uh, first three weeks assignments. We received those uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I know what my schedule looks like uh, weeks one, two, and three. And then um, we will, starting this coming Monday, I will get an email saying, okay, week four, you're going to this location. And so we know about roughly five weeks in advance uh, as to where we're going. Uh, and then um, it's not released to the schools who's coming until the Monday of, of the game. And uh, that's all for, you know, a lot of different security reasons, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, believe it or not, the bookies in Vegas, you know, if they ever knew who was coming, they, they, they tell us that they know as much about officials as they do coaches and players. Yeah. So there's kind of a dark side to, to the, to the whole sporting thing. And so it's, for those reasons, they keep those assignments confidential. It's Randall Kaiser, official in the Southeastern Conference. And Randall, as we wrap up the interview today, I think our listeners and the people who watch this video would like to know, and you, you don't necessarily have to say, but if you get an assignment and you see that school, do you hang your head? Is there, is there schools? Uh, I know there are, but is there places that you think, you know, those fans are rowdier or anything <laughs> like that? 
You know, no, I, I look at all of them as a blessing, and, and I, I tell everybody, I say, I'll go wherever they want to send me. Uh, I've been so fortunate in this in this uh, this hobby that I've been to 30, I think it's 32 states officiating collegiate football. And, um, you know, not very many people know where Moscow, Idaho is. <laughs> I've been to Moscow, Idaho a number of different times to officiate football. Uh, and uh, so it's it's been very good to me. And I'll go wherever they will allow me to go. Well, Randall, we appreciate your time. And we'll be looking for you on Saturdays, but pray that you don't stand out. Well, it'll, just look for that, that white hair sticking out from the cap. That's Randall. Thank you for your time, buddy, and good luck this season. All right, Brian. Thank you.